Can we all agree that using a garage sale to frame the narrative of Michael's departure was an absolute genius move for the showrunners? And for me, it ranks up there with one of the best ideas that the office writers ever had. You're just, you're kind of losing them. Right, gotta keep things moving for the almighty algorithm. Hey, I'm Chris and I'm reviewing every episode of The Office ever here on my channel. And today we're looking at the garage sale. This is romantic. Lots of spoilers ahead. We've got a ton to talk about, like the Easter eggs and in-jokes that are in the items in the garage sale. We're gonna be talking a lot about Michael and Holly and how the garage sale represents the deeper meaning, as well as what it meant for the series itself. And then we're gonna rate this one. Holy I know, so much to get to, let's go. I understand nothing. Opening on a wide shot of the charity garage sale in the office's warehouse, the staff are bringing their money makers to the respective tables. And 10 cents of every dollar is going into the party fund so we can throw parties for ourselves. Mark that for one of my favorite jokes in this one. But these opening shots reveal a ton of items. So let's go ahead and take a look at everything that we can spot out. First up in Michael and Holly's table, we have the infamous and most obvious Easter egg of this episode with the St. Pauli girl sign. That's definitely gonna come up in the deeper meaning, probably right alongside this sweet broken plasma screen TV. By the way, you're not really supposed to lay plasmas flat. They break all the more, but this is already broke. This tropical hat is giving me some sandals Jamaica vibes. Michael's bow flex can also be seen here. That was first spotted in the dinner party, but it also makes an appearance in Threat Level Midnight. A mattress and box spring can be seen behind Michael and Holly as well, presumably a nod to their cohabitation, leading them to like reduce duplicate items. Looking around, Stanley's selling a lot of Christmas items. Moroccan Christmas. Moraka Christmas. And a telescope. Angela is selling a lot of delicate cat related items, as well as some books here, which is interesting because they appear to be like soft cover romance novels, but I don't know what kind of romance novels Angela would be reading. Also, this one kind of looks like it has flames on it, so maybe it's religious text. The Da Vinci Code. Nice. I would take the Da Vinci Code so I could burn the Da Vinci Code. Andy's table has his standard fare of neatly folded polos, a Cornell sign, a giant model sailboat, and a trombone on the backside. Jim and Pam seem to be selling just a few random pieces of decor, including that clown painting. Also, I don't really know what this is. Is this one of those lawn ornament orbs? Like, what are the points of those things? It feels like, like there's this secret club of people who own those things and they get the significance of it. I, I, I don't get it. So maybe someone leave that in the comments. He's also selling some golf clubs. Meredith has a lot of items, mostly consisting of leftover kid stuff, which would also include dirty jeans and a deer head. Ryan's got the jarred goods. Kevin has the board games and a diorama labeled The Mountain Hamlet of Millerschwill. <laughs> and the idea of Kevin just like working on this either as a teenager and then keeping it his entire adult life or sometime in the last year just made this thing. It's delightful. Creed seems to be selling some paper, which also has Dwight's interest, along with some other boxed goods that look like Maybe they fell off the back of a truck. He's also pedaling a guitar here. Kelly has some religious items, some New Year's Eve looking stuff, some fabrics, some romance novels, and a lot of bright and colorful clothing items. Oscar has his collection of Will and Grace DVDs, a lot of owls for some reason, and a sweet DVD VHS combo. Aaron and Phyllis both just seem to have random crap from around their house. I should also point out that everyone is selling their items for an insane amount of money. 200. 500. 20. 45. Get lost. Damn it. So unless the local Scranton, Pennsylvania market in 2011 for tchotchkes was extremely inflated, even by our current standards, these prices are insane, which does mean that they were hoping to actually turn some jack for their charity of choice. The party fund. And while this joke in the opening sequence would suggest that no one was there, there actually are plenty of randos walking around during this episode. And I can't tell, but the body language of this specific person would suggest that she's not happy with one of our top three accountants. All right, so the plot of the garage sale, let's get into it. A plot. You know, in case 
Maybe something changes? I don't have an in-case. Do you have an in-case? No. B plot. Through the art of the swap, I will walk out of this garage sale with the finest item here. Which alongside the cluttered feeling of the warehouse of Easter eggs and random crap, and considering this is a 22 minute episode, and it really needed to leave us feeling 100% happy to watch the heart and soul of the series leave, it seemed really busy. And I'm glad they didn't try to shove in like another plot line. Should we make it a little interesting? Sure. Uh... Right, they did shove in a completely unnecessary plot line about America's favorite lame pastime based on a TV show that was so far removed from the general audience that it seems like it was completely random. Or maybe it was put there on purpose. Let's make a note to uh, include the Dallas TV show and the deeper meaning somehow. For now, Mike leaves a garage sale to confirm to his possible soon-to-be father-in-law his intentions to marry his daughter by first fake firing her over the phone, something that Michael has now done twice by my count. Can I just clean out your desk? I'm sorry. You have an ex-punk! <laughs> Stanley Hudson, you are fired. I gave Ryan the sales job. You should have seen your face! Hank is our security guard. Oh, he I will be go. ushering you out. <laughs> I am going to have to fire your daughter, Holly, because she's such a terrible employee. I'm just kidding. Maybe you shouldn't fake fire people anymore. Then it's confirmed that this is actually a one-sided voicemail conversation. To ask her to marry me. And I was just hoping that you would give me your approval. And this isn't a joke. Which feels faintly reminiscent of the opposite kind of phone call Michael made back in season three. Well, just so you know, it's not me, it's you. Okay, buddy. As Dwight's trade-up quest begins, he talks Meredith into a deal which would have Dwight out a thumbtack, but leave with a used candle. We see Dwight's full sales ability on display as he talks Kelly into trading her romance novels for a half-used candle. A little interesting context here. About a year prior to this episode airing, a story went viral thanks to several blogs. Blogs are out, but people are texting each other. The story was about a 15-year-old kid who traded a cell phone he'd been given for another cell phone using the classified section of the internet known as Craigslist. He would then trade that phone for an iPod Touch, which he would then trade for a dirt bike, which then he would make several trades over time for nicer and nicer dirt bikes until he traded one of those for a MacBook Pro which he then traded as a 15 year old kid still for a Toyota 4Runner, which he then traded for a custom off-road golf cart. And then after several more trades, he ended up with a 1975 Ford Bronco, gleaning all of the jealousy from my real bro of a daughter whose dream car is a fully restored mid 70s Bronco. Not enough for this kid though. He traded that in for a 2000 Porsche Boxster, which, I'll side with my kid on this one, I would stick with the Bronco, but the story kind of blew up all over the place, which I always thought was really interesting. A kid started with a janky old cell phone and turned that into nearly $10,000 worth of stuff, confirming in a sense that with some elbow grease and the right words, you could probably always find some upward mobility, but also watch out because two can play at that game. Jim's evil prank is now in full force in which a very small bag of legumes is gonna mess with Dwight in a very big way. My hunch here is that his end game was just to do the plant swap thing as we'll see later, but catching Dwight in the trade game was just a happy bonus. Cut to Hollis on the phone with her folks and it's clear that they're not doing so well, losing focus and having difficulty recalling details from their short-term memories. And this can be a real problem for human beings, which causes Holly to follow up with Phyllis on how handling this with her folks went. It didn't go down easy, but she's made some friends and it's already better than it was. Meanwhile, Pam's still on this no caffeine thing since the new year. Oh, which one's decaf? Me and the blue. Oh, and maybe it's just me, and I'm not Googling this to check, but Bottoms Up has to be an adult magazine, right? Interesting inclusions here, the set design, among several different items, we have pastries and, and Hank's albums. Shame if all of this would just go up in flames, which is exactly what Michael was about to do. People always say that Pam didn't really do anything as office admin, I would beg to differ. She stops Michael from burning down the building and she pulls together a small group of individuals, which Michael respects, 
and they discuss ideas for proposing to Holly in a way that might not set the entire building on fire. And I'm not really sure that lighting a thousand Serenity by Jan Candles in the annex was really a safer route, considering that, you know, like if just one of those things would fall over, it could spark a chain reaction, which would have the entire staff back in season five. I guess, thank God, or I guess in this case, Dwight, that a fire suppression system might have actually been installed. But I'm getting ahead of myself. Let's check in on how that board game plotline is going. You can't go, you're dead. I shot you five moves ago. Yeah, I told you, you can't shoot people. I told you we're way past rules. Yep. So back in the conference room, Michael kind of nicely throws shade at Jim and Pam's proposal. Oh, hey. yeah, you didn't say that the weather was bad. That sounds perfect. I've never really known how to read this. Like, Maybe it's Mike trying to control himself, like maybe he's amused, but he isn't saying what he's actually thinking. And it's a hard read because saying exactly what he's thinking is Michael's entire thing. Oh my God. Is that Jim's? What? Michael. Hard cut with no resolution to the break room. Holly tells Michael that she thinks she needs to go back home, make sure that her parents are doing okay and taken care of. Take note, humans, especially young ones, the amount of class that Michael Scott pays Holly in this situation is astonishing. That's right. We have arrived at a point in the office when I would say that if you want to know how to handle a situation that is really difficult and touchy, just look to Michael Scott. I could see why Holly's into this guy. Then she begins to propose to him. Michael Scott, will you? No, no, shh. Shut it, shut it. Mm. <laughs> oh God, nope, nope, nope. 15 minutes in and the B plot wraps up in a pretty satisfying way. Leave the telescope. And this C plot wraps up in an actually pretty satisfying way. But you guys know I'm a, I'm a sucker for Kevin. And that is Dallas. That leaves us with Michael Scott's proposal, which once again, feels like it hits very close to home for me, as in it's literally what I did when I proposed. Like the second time I proposed to my wife. Back, it's a whole different story. Back before The Office, even season one, even started filming, I took my favorite human, Sarah, to different places that were huge parts of our relationship. Like a walk we'd done a thousand times to a little island on a nearby lake, a balcony at some friend's house that had some significance, and then we ended up at my house, which I had this whole candlelight setup thing going on. I was going through my spiel, and then I had her son get all dressed up in a tuxedo and bring in the ring. Got down on one knee, yada, 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 rest is history. Nonetheless, even with all of the planning that I put into that one afternoon evening, I can definitely echo the sentiment shared here. I knew Pam was gonna say yes, but I was still scared. You were scared? Yeah, it's scary. I knew Sarah would say yes. I just wanted it to be perfect. Walking her down memory lane, reminding her of the things that we had been through, and then asking for her privilege to hold my hand as we go through the rest of life together. You're welcome, Sarah. And that's why this has always resonated so well with me. That seems to be because it's the same thing that Michael's going for here. He leads Holly on this tour of the premises, walking her through some of the revelations he's had and the major steps that they had in their relationship along the way. It definitely reminds me of the advice that Jim gave Michael on Holly's first day in the office. Michael, you can court her as you get to know her, you know? I mean, the office is a great place for that. As the couple make it into the break room, the entire staff is present and several of them propose to Holly. And I have no idea why. I have no frame of reference for this at all. I, I think it was just a way to include other people, which Michael considers his family. And this leads to the annex. It looks like Michael broke Holly's chair in order to recreate how they first connected years ago. This is, of course, cut short with sprinklers setting out to fight this fire. Holly accepts the proposal and the staff rush in to celebrate, only to hear some very different news. We're moving to Colorado. All of us? Holly has to go back to Colorado. I'm going with her. I'm leaving. Having just taken some shots himself at Jim and Pam's perfectly imperfect proposal, Michael finds himself 
in the same situation. With the rain pouring down from the ceiling, his, the entire staff rushes in, and it all really reflects this chaotic, deeper sense of emotions. It's a perfect representation of the joy and excitement just meshed right up against the implications of this moment, that Michael is getting everything he's ever wanted, and he would also be leaving the office. The writer set off this season with the goal of seeing growth in Michael Scott and getting us fans on board and satisfied with how the character would depart the series. So let's talk about that more in the deeper meaning. What does a bean mean? Someone please explain it to Kat. Garage sales are amazing, so it dawned on me that maybe not everyone in the corner of this planet is actually aware of what a garage sale is. Maybe you are. Where I'm from, I would call what the office is doing here more like a rummage sale, which is what I see churches and elk lodges or whatever do, which is they set up a day and everyone brings their crap to sell. And then normally as a seller, you would pay a little fee for your space and you know, for the crowds that the event space would bring in. It's not a huge degree of difference between a rummage sale and like what a flea market is, and then even an open market, which is a thing in several spots around the world. But a garage sale is really just a smaller version of that. It's an individualized version of these types of markets that happen out of a person's garage or in a yard. It's like a yard sale is a thing too. Typically, these sales consist of only resale items from around a person's house. Things like outgrown clothing, old decor, which no longer fits their current style, or items that they just generally don't want to have sitting around in storage anymore. Homeowners set these items on their tables, they put arbitrary prices on them, and believe it or not, humans just drive around looking for garage sales. If you know, you know. But before being busy every single Saturday that I could see my breath, I'd actually drive around with my daughter looking for hidden treasures marked for some insanely low prices. At one time I found like four NESs for five bucks a piece. And I also got like a sweet laptop over there from 1996 for a dollar. What am I gonna do with it? I have no idea. Right now it's just on display with the rest of my retro machines that I never touch. Nevertheless, it's one of these intoxicating things to shop at garage sales. But the experience of selling your things at a garage sale, at a yard sale, it can be conflicting because there's a whole process. A person has to look around their house or their lives and see all of the things that they've amassed and realize that it's time for a change. And once you know it's time for you to get rid of your old stuff and make room for the new, it can be challenging. We've all gotten attached to the old things and it's not easy to forge into the future confident and free from the baggage that you've held on to for years and years. Still, even when you've made up your mind, seeing someone walk away with that thing that you've treasured for quite a long time it can be really hard. But often, it's not until we've departed with the old that we're really able to move on to the next stages of life. It's never easy, and it involves a significant amount of risk. So I would contend that the garage sale as a framing device in this episode is a way to depict how Michael is ready to move on with that next stage of life. He's not perfect. As we can see, he still kind of has his paws on some of his old stuff, but it's important to realize something that I think that gets overshadowed with the jokes and the quick pace of this episode Michael was carrying this $200,000 ring on him already. He, like Jim, was just so ready. Just didn't have a solid plan of what he was gonna do and was probably waiting for the right moment. And also probably waiting on some confirmation from Holly's side that she would be ready to commit as well. Again, exhibiting growth from past mistakes. To do me the honor of making me your husband. Oh, Michael. So with the garage sale episode had to execute on this proposal, getting Michael ready and making it big enough to satisfy. That's what she said. <sighs> but it also had the job along with the rest of season seven to go out with the old and in with the new. That 
For a series to really usher in a new stage of its evolution, it would have to make a clean break from the old no matter how painful it would get. Thus the reliance on a series staple of the Jim Dwight prank, the character spotlights that we get to see in Garage Sale, as well as the Dallas board game fun are all intended to draw the bulk of the jokes in this episode in order to ensure that the average viewer would be confident in a new world order or a post Michael office, which is something that we're going to talk about next week. For now, the garage sale episode is rated consistently as fans top 10 episodes of the series. And interestingly, it rated as one of the best pieces of media on IMDb in general. So that's cool. Let's rate this thing. This is the worst. I would normally break out the cold open individually, but in this case, it's all just one story and it might've actually lended a little bit better to the pacing had you know, this sequence just played after the theme song. No. Stop it. Just go. One thing I always appreciated about this episode of The Office is that it packs just so much into this 22 minute runtime, considering that the same series would have similar runtimes for episodes devoted to like healthcare in which practically nothing happens and is quite the testament to what the writers were challenged to do with this episode. Invoking familiar feelings with garage sales and effectively building on top of the drama that's already boiling up for the previous 18 episodes. And on top of all of that, the years of established character journey for Michael Scott, the garage sale uses its time super efficiently. I've watched this episode several times over the years and several times for this review, and I've always been amazed at how effective it is at rushing through Michael's proposal without really giving us a ton of substance. It is just well executed written by John Vitti, who was mainly a producer on the series and directed by Steve Carell himself, which going into this, I had no idea. And if you look back at episodes directed by Steve Carell, directed and written by Steve Carell, he always treats the character with so much respect. The Garage Sale episode is more than anything I could have imagined for a Michael Scott send off. That's not to say it's without its issues. Personally, I don't think the Dallas board game plotline really lends to the message of the show at all. I never did get that reference put into the deeper meaning, did I? Well, that's Dallas. It's possible that that plotline was written as a way to tell fans and critics who've been taken to forums and social media to express that there isn't an office without Michael Scott. There was a firm belief in the writer's room that there is an office without Michael Scott and that they are just making it up as they go. We must honorably adhere to the rules that we are making up on the spot. Having spoken with Brent Forrester, that is the sentiment that they had. Greg Daniels firmly believed that the office could exist without Steve Carell. Okay, but I have to stop. I'm going to get into all of that next week. But even while the subplot only loosely works within the narrative, I can't help but say that's Dallas when I one up anyone in any context of life. So, you know, there's that. Dallas, indeed. <laughs> Executing this proposal sequence was a huge undertaking, and I have to give them credit for that. From what I can tell, they did this all in one take, even though the crew didn't think it went as smoothly as it could. Steve Carell was convinced that it would just read as wholesome and that it would work at mistakes and all. And I agree. I think it works extremely well. It is a sequence which can actually invoke emotions from me. So the garage sale easily gets a five out of five from me. It did what it needed to. It was creative. It was crazy funny and even warrants the emotional reactions from this cold dead heart of mine. <laughs> I love this episode, but I also hate this episode, which spins me into an internal monologue similar to Dwight's. But because he is his own worst enemy, the enemy of my friend is my enemy. So actually Jim is my enemy, but I hate to see Michael leave, but I love to watch him go. As we get closer to saying goodbye, Michael, if you have any thoughts you want to share on the deeper meaning of Michael's arc in the series, hit me up on Discord, email, or any of my other social media, and just brain dump there. I'd love to include everyone's thoughts as we get closer to that monumental occasion. Next week, we're going to be taking a break from the field guides, like I said, in order to take a look into what some have called 
the useless seasons of The Office that shouldn't exist, which is why I always start The Office back over as soon as Michael leaves. I don't agree, but also those comments never use punctuation. So there's that. Thanks so much for watching, and we'll see you next time.